Okay, so um, next up, um, we have a talk by Luigi Verona, titled Boring Music and How to Make It Interesting. And I would like to take this opportunity to mention two people. Yeah, thank you, Christopher Arndt, for supporting. And also, thank you, Daniel Appelt, for supporting the convention. Yeah, and uh, without further ado, please welcome Luigi Verona. Hey. Thank you. Um, I should have some signal from the, from the laptop already. Try it. Okay, this is just a calm track, just to understand how loud it is. All right, so uh, I want to start with uh, an interesting exercise, and the exercise is this. If you want to enhance your music production skills, you might want to take a track that you really like and try to reproduce it. It's a time-honored method. And uh, I want to show you several examples and ask your opinion on how you think these things could be reproduced or how you would approach them. So let me show you a small piece of music, short piece of music. So there you go. So think, how would you reproduce it? Okay, so what would your approach generally be? Can right, so true, no cowbells used. So, yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, how would you typically do it, right? I mean, uh, um, I, I guess you would probably, you know, listen to the drums, get some samples that sound somewhat like that, right? You, would you, you, you heard some notes played, so you'd probably find a synthesizer that does that. So, yeah, just like... Like kind of bells, right? Okay, I'm gonna do that. Then hear that. Like these stabs. Well, you, what are you probably gonna do there? You're probably going to use like cutoff frequency, like a filter, and then maybe automate it, right? W would you generally agree with that? That's how you would do it, yeah? So, so now let me give you another example. So I want you to listen carefully, and then maybe somebody can tell me how would they would reproduce this. So imagine you're listening to something that has something like this and you're, okay, I want to do a similar tune. Okay, so what, what are the versions? Yep. Yep, okay. And then you would try to reproduce the same thing. Okay. So sequencer, randomizer, or ar arpeggiator, okay. Okay, so this is, so uh, I mean, uh, the, you could probably do it this way, but there is a much simpler method. But I'm glad that you made the mistake. This was intended. So now, actually, so you would find it very difficult to reproduce it using a step sequencer or only a step sequencer. A, a, how it was actually made was this. There was this. So there's the main arpeggio that you can hear very clearly, and then something weird in the background, right? So what it is, one arpeggio playing, and then the slightly quieter version of a double, doubly sped loop of that arpeggio, which is mixed. And then I tried to find the exact position where it would sound interesting. And so without knowing the method, you can spend hours doing that, but actually it's very simple. Now here's another one. Uh, try to think how you synthesize this one.
So what? Okay. So somebody says pole stretch. Interesting option. Uh, no, but it, it's an interesting option. So Zinad sub effects. So uh, tell me. Let let me start this again. Tell me how many layers of sound you like. How many synths you would need for this? Just one. You will. You would be able to do this with one. Okay. And what would you automate to get it? Okay, so just I'm translating for the video. So yeah, it's like using a velocity mapping where yeah, where you have like quieter notes most of the time filtered, but then sometimes you get yeah, that's the real method. So in reality, this is an obscure jazz loop. That's the jazz loop. Yep, that's it. That's that. This is it without effects. It's just played in the looper. Now I'm adding echoes, and now I'm adding a reverb wet signal 100% with a very long tail. Right. So, so it's like it takes you two minutes to do this. Uh, I mean, it takes you longer to find a jazz loop that will work or any other loop that will work. But the point of this demonstration is this. So we started with something that sounds relatively clear. You have notes, so you would probably think, okay, I have to create notes, and then I have to do something to parameters of these notes to get the effect. Then the second example was already much more complicated because it sounded different. If you just use the node-based node approach, you can do it, but it's kind of difficult. With this one, to be honest, I don't think you'll get it with just one sense, but let's say that you would. It would take a lot of time. What, why would you need to do this? Well, imagine you got these 20 seconds down, but then suddenly you're listening to the recording and the composer does something absolutely different. And you're like, okay, where do I automate these parameters to? So, so you would pitch shift it two octaves down. And I mean, question is, will you get the same effect? I tried. Uh, but you can try. But yeah, like typically, I mean, right, because if you're pitch shifting down without changing anything else, then it will sound very, it will not sound like this. So what I'm saying is that if you don't exactly know the method, while of course you can get the similar result, you will have much less degrees of freedom. Because if you, because over here, like if you're, because you will have to first of all find the pitch, the correct notes to play this, which notes will you use to play this? where you will pitch them. Are you going to pitch all of them or just some of them? And this, of course, yeah, this is pitch shifting, actually, of two loops. Running the same time. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, it's pitch shifting, and then the re reverb does this thing because it just takes everything that you had before, and then it also mixes it with the current signal. So in order to get this sophisticated texture, the composer who used that method could have spent two minutes on this. If you're using the wrong method, you're thinking, this is a genius and we get back to the original loop. So, so the, the points of these demonstrations and the subject of my talk is how the tools that we're using, uh, how they affect the music that we write. And uh, I actually want to start with, um, with, some, with an interview that I listened to of Brian Eno from the 80s. And, uh, there are several interviews, and Brian Eno was generally very, like, he's very well-spoken, and uh, he talks about music theory a lot. And one of the things that he said, and I listened to that interview, like, in 2000-something, was that one of the th new things that happened in the 20th century was that we were able to s record music on tape. And what that did was that it made uh, sound malleable and durable. Now you can actually change what you, what you, before that, were, were just hearing in, you know, in the air, in the ether, and you couldn't change that, and um, uh, and of course uh, the, uh, this is something that all of us kind of know, but because all of us here were born into the world where this is normal, we cannot imagine how it could be different. Just like we cannot imagine living without refrigerators, and it could be surprising to learn that in the past restaurants were not offering any menus because 
that didn't have you know the food stored anywhere. So you would come in and they would say, "We're serving this soup." That's it. There's no choice. So uh, the same thing with uh, with uh, having tape. Uh, now there are certain consequences that are not entirely obvious at first, and one of them, of course, is that music can now be listened to several times. And uh, this is this is something that is already pretty revolutionary. People did not have that before. You're listening to the exact copy of a track that that you heard just two minutes before, and uh, a lot of the music that exists today and was written in the 20th century would not be possible without this opportunity because there are many tracks that are, sound more interesting on second, third, fourth listen, where you discover layers of details. And in fact, many composers would not even have the reason to add any details because they know that it will not be heard. You would only add details that actually enhance the live performance. And so if you look at the orchestra, it's you know, very well tuned. And from the perspective of a modern electronic musician, it is somewhat simplistic in that you, you, you hear what you get. Of course, actually, many things are tuned so that they really sound very, very well. But you know what I'm saying. Like, there's not a lot of underlying detail that you could find in some electronic compositions or even rock music, but that were now possible to explore. Um, so... Another thing, of course, is that you could manipulate the sound physically, and this is something that people started doing uh, with, uh, with a lot of uh, pleasure by manipulating tape and uh, gluing tape pieces together, creating tape loops, and uh, of course try to treat non-music uh, sounds as musical. I would say that the results are typically kind of difficult to listen to in my personal view, and it has to do probably with the fact that um, it was just very new and people were very excited. Um, but uh, when probably all of you and myself were kids and were exploring what tapes mean, we actually didn't probably do a lot of tape cutting. I definitely did, didn't. And uh, I think that there is a very interesting and a very objective reason for this. Because if you think about tape reels that were like in the 30s, 40s, 50s, it would look something like this. Right. So as you can see, the tape is readily available. You just cut it and do whatever. When I was a kid, I didn't have that. I had this. Yeah, and uh, th th this means that the tape is really inaccessible. You, you need the this, this screwdriver to get it out. Then you have to put something in. Then you can also see that it's really closely attached to these reels themselves. And it's like, how do I get it out? So there were people who did do this, these things. But, you know, it was not very common and you have to really get into it. I've seen some tape loops that people created just like that and they had to really build it out and you could even buy some of them. But I never did that. Uh, what we did do, though, is um, we tried to do... Well, like we understood that now we have this malleable material that we can do something with. And because we didn't have much equipment, we did what we could with the equipment that we had. So this is, this is uh, my childhood you're looking at. Um, this is the Sony uh, FBB170. <laughs> Sonoy, right. Uh, it's FH, sorry. Uh, interestingly enough, what you're looking at is the hi highest quality photo of this device that I could find. Apparently, none of the devices that were big in the 90s have good photos, almost none of them. I don't know why. Uh, maybe they there were too numerous and the internet was not there yet, along with good cameras. So what we did was this. And um, so some of these devices, and this device in particular, had an interesting thing. So you have a recording deck, and then you have a microphone line in. So you would do this. You would record your voice on this tape, then you would put it here, and both the line in and the mic and, and the play deck were actually mixed in order and then then inserted here. So what you would do is you would start copying your voice to the to another cassette while speaking again. And so then you could do these entertaining things like a dialogue with yourself. And I remember doing these entertainment programs that then we would show to our friends and our parents with like being in the studio and then Another Luigi comes in and starts arguing with the Luigi that started the program, and 
stuff like that. And of course, you, you would also think, hey, I really want to do music. I want to make something that is my own, but I don't have synthesizers. The computers were not really available back then unless, you, unless it was very expensive. And so what you would also do is you would try to find pieces of music that have just the drums or they just have just the strings or pads. And then you would try using the same method. Uh, you would try to get this, like, so first of all, what you would do is you would find pads and then you would copy them several times so that there are like several blocks of them. And then you would use something like Walkman. Remember Walkman? Yeah. Uh, and you would... Uh, you would start playing one tune in the Walkman and the other tune would be playing here and you will mix them. And it would sound something like this. So this is a pad, right? Right, and it's in the beginning of the track so it's duplicated. And then you take something that hopefully sounds more or less in the same beat. And it's all very low quality because you add noises from one tape to another. Yeah, and then of course you cannot go anywhere with it because the tunes then go into something non-compatible. And so that's it. And I remember having uh, a friend coming in and they had like a normal, normal rock band, like they played instruments well. And they tried recording their band using the same method, like they didn't have multi like these multi-track recorders that were actually also available, but I think that in the 90s they were not as widely available, I think. And uh, yeah, it was, it was like huge, like a wall of noise, and then there were music somewhere in the background. But it sounded really cool, like, wow, guys, you did it. Um, so, so, so I think, I think that this, this is a very important, uh, kind of very important mindset, because when you're treating music as something malleable, then you begin to realize that you have absolutely different, different approach to how you write music. And I think that this is important, uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about it, because it changes the music into something else. Uh, and although the tape stuff kind of went away, and now you can see these experiments only, you know, in some cases where people are really into it and they want to go retro. Uh, in, in, in all actuality, this did not go away. And uh, in fact, you kind of heard a little bit of this. I, I can show you examples of uh, music that is actually tape music. It uses the same principle, but it doesn't sound like it. So let me give you the first example. So this sounds just like somebody's playing piano, right? Yeah, it sounds nice, right? It's very soothing. Uh, in reality, I mean, it is somebody playing piano, but it's actually laid over four times, and then it's shifted a little bit so that you have this phasing going on, and they all have slightly different length, the loops, as if you would have actual tape loops, and then they're playing and creating new combinations against each other. And so you can have a small composition that really explores this concept, and from like from listening to this it's not even immediately clear what's going on you can't imagine somebody just playing notes using some long tail reverb right on it but that's not how it was done and in a way uh, when you're listening to the effects of this it's humans are very bad at randomizing things and so this is this is perfect because it's not absolutely random it doesn't give you some noise that you don't want to hear you can actually play something but it gives you enough variation so that it's interesting and it floats you away. Here's another example. Uh, this is more subtle. This is like uh, ambient drone music. You hear pads and um, it's basically done with the same method. There are several loops of pads mixed in so nobody's really making decisions to play these notes. And if you, if you practice a little bit and you kind of understand what notes to play initially for the original loop, it can sound very, very nice. It can sound like there are no dissonant notes there. It sounds very, very, like it sounds very deliberate, right? But it's not. Well, not really. 
So, yeah, tape music didn't go away. Um, so that's so that that one of the important things that I believe changed about music and made it into this concept of electronic music was the creation of tape and this concept of uh, sound being malleable. And we still have that actually sound now is just even more malleable than we had it before. We can do anything we want with sound because digital representation of the, of the sound is as malleable as it gets, I guess. Um, but there's another very important uh, thing that happened. And this is, uh, this is, I think, is even more consequential because whenever we're looking at music that was made using tape, it was either this musique concrète or it was or it was something that is really just recorded normal note music more more or less most of the time uh it didn't kind of i don't think that it dramatically changed the thinking of kind of ordinary musicians around the world who are used to writing melodies who are playing in bands so another thing was this uh, so synthesizing sound in itself proved to be pretty simple uh, technically and you can actually today go to SoundCloud and there's a special account that shows the recording of the first computer generated music back in the 1940s and so generating sound in, it was not that difficult the difficulty was in creating a uh, sequencer uh, I mean no computers right you have to create a hardware sequencer and it's not that simple and it took quite a while before they actually created the sequencer that was easy to use and that could be marketed to the general public, or should we say to the general musician's public, because all of that stuff was pretty expensive and the music creation process was not democratized like it is right now. So, uh, so uh, actually, even before these sequencer appeared, there were many original things also based like on tape loops. For example, there was uh, Rhythmicon or there was uh, Rhythmate and Sideman. Do you want to hear like, what, what these sounds like? Uh, Rhythmate. So Rhythmate is a 1957 tape loops based uh, drum machine. That's what it sounded like. So this is an actual recording of somebody playing on a tape loop and then you can speed it up, do a little like, things and they have presets and you just switch them and of course, you know, no, they did not have the aim and break, no. Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Somebody had to ask. Um, so there, here's the Sideman. This is a pretty cool device. It was the first commercially pr available drum machine. It does not use tape loops. Instead, it, it's almost mechanical. It like, uses things which are turning and like, mm, I don't know how to explain this. It's, it's, it's pretty complicated principle. Like they had this circle thing and this thing would go around it and trigger certain sounds and create a rhythm. So they would have like mechanical presets there, kind of. So, but very interesting. Yeah, but so, uh, of course, uh, what's, what's interesting are the actual hardware sequencers. And uh, one of the probably first ones, I'm not sure if it is literally the first one, but one of the first ones was Bukla 100. Uh, so, ah, ah, very nice, yeah. Uh, you want to hear how that sounded like? Yeah? Absolutely, let's, let's do this. So, yeah. Yeah, it's very nice. I mean, actually, it could do a lot of things. Uh, Bukla, this is just one example. Uh, it, like, it was difficult to choose. I had to choose something that sounded like notes. You can, you can also change a lot of things there. And it already had a sequencer. So these are the sequencers. A 10, 16-step sequencers. And, uh, yeah, so... Then you had... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you had another very known sequencer, which was uh, Moog 960 this one now uh because we're talking about retro stuff i picked a like a, a blurry photo on purpose yeah really look see yeah retro <laughs> okay so now so that yeah that's that's the high quality version of it so this uh, uh moog was even more interesting i think uh, it had much more possibilities so it had three rows of eight steps you could either use them together to form a 24-step uh, line, or you could use two of these for melodies, and this one hook up it to a special like noise generator to use it for the drum line. So this is already pretty sophisticated, right? Uh, but notice that all of these sequencers have a very interesting, um, 
let's uh, put it this way, characteristic, is that all of them are pretty short, right? And if you think about how like a composer would write sheet music and they just have this notebook and they can write however long they like. Here you can't really. Uh, I mean, you can if you, if you write it, if you write a certain piece of music beforehand, then you can probably sit down and just mechanically program it. But if you're experimenting with it, uh, well, so first of all, let's say you start it and it starts, tuk, 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 right? You don't want to restart it. So many of them, if not all of them, would loop. Once you're hearing something looped, um, you begin to think a little differently about it because you realize that not all melodies sound looped well. So you would think, can I write something that will not irritate me? Can I write something that sounds well when it's looped? And so you, you would do that. Oh, by the way, yes, I want to show this one as well. Um, so anybody own that? No, groove boxes? Yeah, do you know what groove boxes are? Groove boxes are devices for a live performance. Uh, this is, they have typically some samples or so sometimes synthesizers, and you can arrange them and play in real time. Uh, pretty cool devices. Um, but another, this device is just very, a very nice example of demonstrating one of the points about these step sequencers is that even if you would want to write longer tunes, and you could do that actually, you could, you, you could write one pattern and then attach it to another one and another one, and there's, there was already a concept of a song inside many of these. So it is very difficult to manipulate, especially editing it. So you, you have to move kind of the, the editing head across the step sequencer, then you have to input the note, and then if you feel that you've made a mistake, you have to understand where it is, you have to go there using all of these shortcuts, and like, you have like three or two buttons here, and you have to use weird combinations of these buttons to do things, so it's very complicated. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that you would probably opt, start going for, uh, opting for very short melodies. And this is very important because because instantly you're starting thinking in a very different logic. You're starting to think, okay, so I've put this very simple melody here. It's, it's almost not a melody, but, but now what I, how do I make it interesting? Right? And there are several ways to make it interesting. So of course, one of the ways is to, you have a sequence that plays along, and then you can drop notes or change them on the fly. Uh, Tangerine Dream did that a lot. They, they would have live performances where they would just change it in real time and it sounds more interesting. And of course, uh, there's another very, very important uh, and I think they're very underappreciated thing is that once you realize that your notes are more or less fixed, you begin thinking, okay, but wait a minute. Remember Bukla? Look how many knobs created the sound. Why should I think about pitch only? Why can't I manipulate other things about it? Why can I, why can I not create a narrative by manipulating something else than pitch? And that was, I think, the first kind of step towards a very different kind of music. Uh, and of course, very quickly, we realized that actually manipulating other parameters does create a very good narrative. And I'll now show you a very uh, known example of this. Yeah, so you have non-changing notes, right? Nothing changes, it's actually kind of boring already. And now we begin to change it. And actually, it's not bad. It sounds very good. We're ready to listen to a lot of that. And if you have several lines of this going on, then you can, you know, you can look at that. You can now tell a story with this, in fact. Uh, by the way, this is not real TB303. I can use this opportunity to say that this is um, a very underrated TB303 software plugin that almost nobody knows about, but which, to my knowledge, is the best plugin there is that emulates TB303. It's called VB303 Venom. Uh, it was made by a programmer, uh, I think, Anton Savov. And uh, it's on K KVR. There's KVR Audio Forum, and you can download this. It's very difficult to operate. It, it uses a step sequencer, just like the one I showed you before, uh, because he believes that the secret of TB303 was in the sequencer. And so if you just use it like in a piano roll or whatever, 
uh, it's not going to sound the same way. So when he re-implemented the sequencer, then he could get this realistic sound. Uh, just recently, uh, ImageLine, FL Studio, released Transistor Bass, basically, you know, a clone of TB303. And uh, I carefully listened to it, and it's, it doesn't compare. It's not even near the quality of this. Like, listen to this. this such a rich sound, like, I, it's unbelievable, right? Look. Granted, I added some delay, so that it's a little more... But it's it's very... See, it's... Uh, it's very rare that you hear such rich overtones. Yeah, it's, it's magnificent. So, yeah. But, uh, so let me also show you, actually... Um, what it might sound like if you just start dropping notes. So, okay, there you go. Um, let me see if I can, if I can. I just want to enhance the, the sound a little bit, it's too quiet. So let me, Right, even adding a couple of notes is already very interesting. I'm just moving one note. Now I decide, okay, I'm going to manipulate something else. So... So I remove the dry sound signal from the echo and I just left the wet one and I can for example start adding more notes So as you can see, although we're limited in the notes, in general, it sounds okay. And if you add more layers to it, then it will sound pretty good. And so losing the control over pitch didn't seem to do much harm, much damage. Uh, so um, I'm going to show you right now something that will probably sound very, very normal. Uh, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, this is going to be a tune. I'm, I'm going to then um, kind of fast forward. Uh, so this is something that most people in the history of humanity would find very, very strange. And like, listen to it and think about what, what would you what would you might find strange about it. Um, and I think that this shift is very similar to what happened to jazz. Uh, most of us don't know this, but if you ever tried playing medieval music, you would know, because you would instantly start syncopating, and you shouldn't do that, because in medieval times they didn't do that. So if you try to play Baroque music, it's very straightforward, and uh, we're like just living in the background of the music that we're typically listening to, we start doing this, this kind of stuff. Uh, so listen to this one, I'm actually going to give it a little run, like 2-3 minutes, and I want you to think about what's, what's happening there. Let me fast forward to somewhere. Okay.
normal. Everybody would agree that it doesn't sound shocking to you, right? It's like, yeah, we've heard something like this before. So the interesting thing about this music that would indeed shock many people who like lived a hundred years ago was that in this tune there's not a single and I, I, I know there's not a single melody that is longer than 16 beats not a single one at the same time notice that although like I think that someone somewhere in the middle this was actually played live so somewhere in the middle I think it was a little too long it could have been faster but in general you can feel the movement right in the music you can feel that something is happening you're not bored right it's not boring and that's that's why I call it boring music I call it very lovingly that if the music is very short well, it's boring so how do we make it interesting well you never actually like you think about it completely differently because from the point of view of just melodical music this is like first grade solfeggio or something right there's nothing nothing special about it but uh, but of course in reality this is not how this music is done you think absolutely differently this was in fact played live i had the 16 beat loop set up in the sequencer and i would just start on and off different uh, clips and just turn the volume on the ones that i wanted to bring in and so now notice we're getting back to the first kind of arpeggiating theme and it feels as if we explored it right it feels as if we've been there we've really explored the theme but we never went beyond 16 beats uh, whereas in kind of classical music approach you need a melody and then you need to develop it and a lot of the music theory would be talking about how to correctly write variations so that you have the satisfaction of having really explored the musical theme and that's not what we typically do as electronic musicians, as musicians who write boring music. Um, I actually was thinking a lot about how this music can be called. For a long time, I called it sound music, but I was really unsatisfied with this because like, come on, sound music, it sounds very stupid. Uh, I actually decided to call this, or I think a better term is uh, sub-melodic music. Because it is melodic, you have notes in there, but it's not fully melodic, so I sub-melodic. I mean, I know it's, uh, you know, a little weird to introduce a term that nobody else uses but me, but, you know, uh, I, th I think it's a, good, it's a good way to label, at least in this talk, this kind of music, sub-melodical music. Um, so it's, it's not about melodies, uh, but it does use melodical phrases, typically very short. Um, one of the things that we recognize very frequently is that whenever we have new technology come in we recognize that resulting art becomes different for example theater and film these are we widely recognize are different forms of art uh, although they're super similar right you have both in, include script uh, both include a director and actors uh, both include some sort of story uh, both include uh, an audience watching right but we universally in fact recognize that even the skill sets of actors required for both mediums are very different and while in theater it's more sequential and it's in a way easier in one sense and more difficult in the other in film there is a lot of editing and because of the nature of how films are made you sometimes film something that you know, something that is in the end of the movie and then film the beginning and this is another challenge although it can be simple for some people uh, I think that the same should be, the, 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 the electronic music that we have should be treated the same way. But uh, as from what I understand, academic world, uh, musical academic world has not understood this. And uh, while theater and film are really treated as different, different forms of art, most music is treated just like music, just that single form of art. And then what you have is that a classical musician or a classical composer would listen to something like this and say, well, this is primitive. Anybody can do that. But of course, actually, first of all, it's not primitive. And it has, even like in the span of 20 years of mainstream musicians going for that kind of compositions, uh, we really have progressed in the way. Remember the first naive experiments, like you would get some trance music compilation. And uh, they would start with like, so like a theme, a bass or whatever, a bass, and then some drums. And then they would add more drums, 
and then another theme, and so then it grows like that stack, and then they, <laughs> hilariously, the tune will end by slowly dissolving the stack back. And at that point in time, you really want to turn it off, because yeah, I get it, and then you're going to remove the drums, then it's going to be only the bass, and then it's going to stop. And nowadays, actually, people don't do that anymore. Uh, even when you listen to some of the known uh, EDM music stuff, uh, they would have like this like this big break in the tune, a lot of melodies, and then it all dissolves into just a, a bass line and a drum, right? It sounds like a simple idea, but people had to actually understand that this is a good way to develop a tune because you have like this emotional uplift, but then you have no place to go anymore. So then you drop it, and then you have, again, space to move on. Um, I think that it is a very simplistic, though, approach that if it's short then the only thing that matters is the rhythm, and therefore all of this kind of short sub-melodic music should be only dance music. Of course, if uh, all, you know, many of you listen to electronic music, you know that there's a huge amount of music that sounds exactly just like that. Very short stuff, uh, but it's not for dancing at all. In fact, it, it could be absolutely different. Um, the purpose could be very different. So I think I think that, that I think that in a way um, I really hope that someday and maybe talks like that might prompt somebody to spend more time developing this field because I think that this is important. It's a new form of art. It's music that never before existed, uh, but now is actually a common language that we all speak without even realizing. I wrote the tune that I showed you, the the sixteen beat tune. I wrote that without thinking about the fact that it's sixteen beat. I just wrote it. And then I just developed it, and I didn't think about it again. Uh, uh, some years ago, I decided to make a tribute to old trance music. And so I decided, I'm going to write this old-school, naive music. And then when I listened back to it, I'm like, they never developed the tunes this way. Like, without being a genius, I just wrote it slightly in a more complicated manner, because we just don't do that anymore. You don't have to be a genius. You just have to constantly listen to the music that is being developed around you and realize that you don't do that anymore. You don't start with a bass, then add drums, then more drums, then some theme, and then go back. It's just not done anymore. It's bad practice. Um, in, the, uh, in the classical world, um, there is this phenomenon called electroacoustic music, uh, which I think, like I don't necessarily understand why it exists. Um, I understand historically why it exists. Historically, it was a lot of fun. I'm gonna show you a composition by Luciano Berrio in 1960s. And here's the interesting thing about it. This is the 60s, right? If you go to a modern electroacoustic concert, it's gonna be the same. So when that was new and working with these magnetic tapes and stuff like that was very new, it was interesting, I get it. But I'm not sure, for example, what this tune tells me, or why should I listen to it. It doesn't, at least to me personally, and this is my personal opinion, I don't feel that this is an enjoyable tune. I feel this is an important tune from a historical perspective. But I'm not sure why would I want to listen to this and what's interesting about it. It doesn't necessarily have a narrative. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have enjoyable sounds. In fact, they're pretty dissonant stabs, and some of them are very, very loud suddenly. Uh, so it seems to make sure that we don't enjoy electronic music somehow. Um, right, but, but I, I think that we should. And, and whenever I listen to electroacoustic music, I, I'm not necessarily, like, I'm not sure why that is happening. Maybe because, well, you have normal classical music, and then you have this weird abomination, and uh, then the modern electronic music that is played around the world as, you know, as pop music or electronic music, stuff like that, is a subset of classical music, but just very simple for, you know, people who don't know music theory, for example. Which, of course, I disagree because I believe that the methods are very different and the thinking is different. Uh, in fact, I think that it's extremely difficult to combine melodical music and sub-melodical music to the point that I've never heard it done good, well even once. Uh, you can hear to some, for example... Get John accepted, yeah. So Jean-Michel Jarre has a lot of uh, uh, tracks that begin uh, as classical sub-melodical tracks, and then he enters the lead, it's like, and it stops working, that's it. And it becomes, uh, all of the sub-melodical textures that he built before then become just a background for the lead melody. I can actually show you this. So let me show you something. 
I'll show you a track that is basically submelodical in nature, and then I'll show you a track that is melodical. And I want you to notice how your brain will actually switch into another mode. So, so, so far I've been showing you only submelodical things, so you would have no problem with this one. So I'm actually going to fast forward to one spot that I wanted to show you. There you go. You can hear the lead, right? There is a certain lead instrument that is on top of everything. And now the same theme is going to repeat. So it's repeating but it stops short of actually being a melody. It doesn't grab anything in your brain to signal it's a melody. I can later go on and sing it to people and they will recognize it, right? At the same time, the tune itself exhibits a lot of emotions. It's not that it's dance tune. It does, this particular tune is actually made in this kind of Berlin electronic music style with things, but right, you have tension, you have emotions, you can, you can get a narrative out there, but there's no melody. Now let me switch on something like a ragtime and its melodies. Notice how your, how your brain reacts. Do, do you see it? Do you feel it? You start thinking differently. It's like, it's like if you were programming and then somebody says, stop, let's go eat breakfast, right? You're like, you have to do something completely different now. And now you can sing it and it will be recognizable without the recording. Well, you can sing it. And, and so it's, it is, uh, there are no scientific experiments that I know of that actually demonstrate that different areas of the brain do this. But there is also, I think, it, it is a plausible hypothesis that when you're looking at a sculpture and when you're looking at a painting, it's slightly different areas of your brain working. And I think the same thing goes on with the with the melodical and submelodical music. It's a different mode of thinking, and these are different forms of art. Um, so I actually want to end on uh, something that uh, kind of stretches this idea of, hey, so we have the super basic stuff, like we have malleable sound, uh, we have, uh, let me see, yeah. There you go, it's gonna get there. We have, uh, we have the submelodical sh idea of short loops, uh, so what else can we do with this? Uh, actually, you can look at how people use tools and recognize how tools shape music that you hear. And here's an example. Uh, so you've heard, like, remember TB303 example, you have a bas bass line, and then you change a parameter, and it's a little different. Um, there is a phenomenon that some of you might know, mod music, which was uh, done and still is done using trackers. Uh, and trackers are... Uh, software which look a little, little bit like Excel tables and uh, you put things in there and it's played usually from top to bottom. Uh, so uh, listen carefully to the bass lines. I chose uh, several compositions of uh, popular mod composer Purple Motion. Just the bass lines and tell me what you think is uh, a specific a thing that is specific to them. Just listen to the bass line. Another tune, same composer. What is special about the bass line? A lot of what? So they use a lot of octaves. Actually, they use a lot of different samples. So if you, they're using different sounds for every note. Or like a couple of notes in the, and the question is why? And a lot of mod music does this. And when you see a trend, you have to ask yourself, why? And it's very rare that it's cultural. If you hear this consistent behavior, it's probably based on tools. And of course, if you look at the normal sequencer, that will look something like this. It's like FL Studio, right? I have to arrange five samples, for example, and then have to go into each piano roll and you know 
think how we would actually do this, maybe put these here, then this here. That's not how a tracker works. It works like this, right? So you have over here a row that denotes what instrument you're using. So just by editing this line, you can say 2443, 242, 443. It's very easy. And that's why you do it. And you can get an interesting effect out of it. And because you're always like, no matter which tool you're using, unless this is a universal music composer, which is yet to be designed by humanity, you're going to have limitations. And in order to make the music more interesting, you're going to be using everything that you have just you know, to, to, to the possible extent, uh, to all the extents possible. So, and so over here, this is what they this started doing because that made bass lines more interesting. They couldn't actually handle parameters. And early tracker music was not able to handle, like, will not have filters. And what they would sometimes do, they would sample filtered notes, like and then do the same thing here. But of course, that sounded mostly crap. So one of the ways was to just have very different samples and make this, this bass line. So that concludes my main presentations. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're open to questions. Woo! Thank you. Or, well, no, it's not really important. It's just that track and music also uh, encourages having uh, short notes uh, all on the same same length. It yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, <laughs> uh, tr I, but the questions are heard. Yeah, in the video recording, I don't have to repeat them. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Just. So. Um, First, a quick disclaimer. Um, uh, I'm very much classically schooled, so I may be a little bit bi biased in this yeah, yeah. view. Um, but when I listen to uh, the music that you've let us hear, um, the feeling I get is um, uh, a feeling of when are you going to the next chord? Like, yep. I, I don't feel, the, and that that doesn't make me comfortable. Instead, that makes me very uncomfortable. Yep. So, and actually, I know of one track that has all the characteristics that you described of uh, of how submelodic tracks, mm -hmm. um, but yet doesn't have that property of when are we going to the next chord, which I would like to propose as a contender for. Um, a working uh, submelodic and melodic combination track, which is the um, uh, Risk of Rain soundtrack. Uh, do you know it? Which one? Risk of Rain. It's a video game. No. But I, mean, I know what you're talking about, and I have a response to this. Okay. My response would be that changing chords is actually not a melody. So a lot of submelodical music, actually specifically tracked music, like this kind of music, uses chord changes a lot. Uh, I didn't show the, the music that I showed you was mostly in the genre that I work in, so it's ambient. It doesn't typically change chords. If you would listen to things like, like Purple Motion has a lot of melodies, for example, but there are a number, especially game music, where there is no melodies, but the chords change. Sure, why not? You can change chords, but it's not a melody. That's just changing chords. You can have chord sequences, and they will not be a melody that you can sing to somebody, and they would recognize that. How would you sing a chord? It, that is, if you define a melody as something that you can sing and recognize, which is a very, of course, very maybe primitive or very narrow sense way of defining it, right? Uh, and in terms of just waiting for the chord change, uh, this is the same as being used to any genre of music. So I didn't want to specifically say that, oh, uh, chords shouldn't change. I, no, 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 no. In fact, Changer in Dream, for example, they did a lot of chord changes. They would they would have the same sequencer running, and there and some synthes synthesizers you could change the tonality, and actually it would change a lot. So you can do that, of course, but you're not introducing a foreground melodical line that makes all the rest just a background and just you know like a companion to this. Do you see what I'm saying here? Um. Yes. 
Even no, no, though I, I mean, still don't agree, but I, I mean, but, yeah, and, and also I think that a lot of uh, so I, I think those, these questions are not are pretty complex yeah. because they touch upon very fundamental yeah. properties of what we know, and I think that it also requires a lot of thought. Uh, it's not that everything that I said is pristinely true. It's the general direction of it. So some nuance I want to touch on as well is that you now only compare uh, the submelodic music with. Uh, melodic music with just a melody, but there are also instances where the uh, where there are multiple melodies, and where in fact the melodies and the chord structures are the same thing. Yeah, yeah so I understand it's, that. It's, it's, it's counterpoint. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. No, I, I can compare it to to counterpoint as well. You cannot do counterpoint and synthesizers uh, like on s s step sequencers. Sure, you still cannot do it, right? So you have to go around these limitations. Remember, I'm not saying that these things are better or worse. I'm saying the only th message that I'm saying is that there are different forms of art, right? I'm not saying that this, uh, oh, the, like classical music is the only good thing or this is the only good thing. I'm just saying they're so different and their principles are so different that they have to be different forms of art. You cannot compare them directly. You cannot say, well, look, Bach here wrote this complicated thing and you have just eight notes. I think this is incorrect because. Just forms of art are different. Just like you can say, like, there was one thing that I didn't say. I can, I can say it now, actually. Uh, so when you're, let's look at, for example, theater and film. Uh, you can actually put a camera and film everything on the stage, right? And I think that whenever you're looking at electronic music and saying, yeah, but you can write all of this stuff and make not only chord changes, make counterpoint and complicated leads, Sure, you can do that, but to me, that would be like saying that the only thing that a camera is good for is filming the stage. And I think that a camera is good for creating something that is very new and very different from theater. And that's the same thing. Like, yeah, classical music is a very different beast, and this is a different beast. But even in the theater example, there are, um, well, I thought there were movies that were like entirely. Uh, um, uh, um filmed in one take. So then that yep. would again be an intermediate form of... I would say that it's very close, although there are much more differences, right, between theater and film, even in the way the audience uh, watches the film. But sure, I mean, it's not a black and white picture, of course. It's a gradient. I agree. Um, I'm not too sure about your, your notion of uh, sub-melodic music. And uh, as you already mentioned, Bach, uh, would you consider the C minor prelude by Bach sub-melodic? No. If it cannot fit in like 8, 16, or 32 steps, no. Well, it has this, this uh, kind of looping structure, and it's just modifying uh, a note here and there. Well, it's that exact tune I would not typically consider, but if we can quibble about some definitions and say, well, actually, this sounds a little bit like it, I would not be against saying that it is. Mm -hmm. You know, then maybe we could recognize that, hey, this is very different. There are actually, so this is a very uh, large conversation. One of the things, for example, that I didn't touch upon at all was that in electronic music, what matters is also the sound with which you're playing it, right? Mm -hmm. If you're taking sheet music of Bach, you can play it with whatever you want in any acoustics that you want, whereas electronic music composer will have this particular sound that he plays there with these particular effects. It's also shifting a little bit how electronic music works, but it was just impossible to talk about all of this in a matter of like in a space of an hour. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you're looking only at a note-based situation, I can imagine things that classical writers wrote and that actually do formally look like some melodical music. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in, in, at the, with the point because also uh, this kind of music is based on uh, new technology because then uh, at that time they, had, they came up with the well-tempered scales and that made uh, um, new music theory and that made a whole uh, yeah. kind of music possible. That's, yes, uh, that's, yes, that's true. an interesting parallel. Mm, um, I have this notion in my head. I, know, I don't know if it's used... Uh, um, chromatic music or chromatic yeah just scale I guess I'm like it's chroma it's it means the color so at the chromatic scale is the whole palette of sounds on on the piano we can play but um, chromatic music 
in my thinking, is something that doesn't use melodies as a, as a way of expressing emotion. But, for example, music that only relies on rhythm and changes of the timbre of instruments. So, to me, what you, what you say, like when you have this TB303 bass line, it's actually, the, the melody is looped. It's just the carrier of the information, and the information itself is the change of the tone, is the change of the timbre, the, the filter sweep, the, the distortion, what happens with the sound itself, not the notes that are played. That's something I just well, think. I, I would actually agree only partially. Uh, that's why I would not call it non-melodical music, because which notes you play actually does affect the mood of the loop. Uh, it really matters sometimes. If I play a, a minor loop or I just play a loop with certain notes, it will matter. The impression will be very different, right? So notes do matter. It's just that they don't matter as much. Yeah, it's all a gradient, as you said. Yeah. There's a scale and we can put our music anywhere we want. It doesn't have to be black or white. Yep. Thanks. Okay, then. Um, thank you for the yep. talk. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank another you. Another round of applause.